Okay. Um, I guess we're off to a start today. So last class, we finished discussing substitution reactions. We're going to come back to those because we're going to integrate those with elimination reactions. We're going to see the parallels in here. And so today we're going to start talking about closely related reactions, um, the elimination reactions. They don't, they're not apparently closely related because they are not substitutions. So we covered the top line last class, and that's nucleophilic substitution. Nucleophile came in, displaced the leaving group. And kicked it out. And the elimination is what happens when instead of attacking the leaving group carbon, the base attacks the hydrogen on the carbon adjacent to the carbon with the leaving group on it. And what we're doing here is we're generating a double bond. You can sort of think of what we're essentially doing is the inversion of that Markovnikov addition of H x across the whole bond. So this is kind of the way back. So the one terminology I'm going to throw out here is I'm going to talk about the, the new term that we're going to see is I'm going to call this the alpha carbon. And again, I'm sorry about this. Alpha carbons tend to mean whatever the person who's thinking about the reaction means it to mean. And I wish there was some specific rule where it always meant the same thing. It doesn't, it normally means the carbon or a carbon adjacent to the reactive center, except when it doesn't. For the purposes of this course, I think the only time I'm going to refer to an alpha carbon is in a section on eliminations. But if you keep doing organic chemistry, you'll see that people seem to throw this term around. It means very different things. And it's what are they talking about? Why are they using the same term? I do not have any answers for those questions not my rules. So just like in the SN1, SN2, we actually have two possible mechanisms here and they're, they're very, very similar. So in the E1 elimination unimolecular, or monomolecular if you prefer your Greek, what you've got is the thing falls apart on its own. This is exactly like what we saw with the SN1. This same intermediate as SN1. It's exactly, the first step is the same. You cannot tell the difference between SN1 and E1 on that first step. The difference happening here is that the next step is your base. And the only reason it's a base and not a nucleophile is because it's taking off a hydrogen instead of attacking a carbon, but it can be the same molecule. It's defined by its role. So in this case, it's acting as a base because it's interacting with the hydrogen, removes that hydrogen. So takes away this hydrogen and the electrons in the hydrogen carbon bond collapse down to give us the new double bond. In the E2 reaction, elimination by molecular, again, in the rate determining step, we've got two molecules. We have the base and we have the electrophile with the leaving group. And in this case, this is choosing to act as a base rather than a nucleophile. And so it's attacking the hydrogen on the alpha carbon or the carbon adjacent to the carbon with the leaving group. And that causes the electrons in the carbon hydrogen bond to make the double bond. And that causes the carbon to lose a bond because it would otherwise be using five orbitals and it can't do that. And so it loses the weakest bond it's got, which is the carbon bromine bond. And you break that and bromine leaves and you end up with a double bond. So these are very, very analogous to the SN1, SN2, except they're kind of completely different, except they're not. So let's think about the E1 reaction. As I said, the first step, is molecule leaves. So again, 
same as S and 1. And then your second step, you have an acid-base reaction. And we generate our conjugate base, or I guess conjugate acid of the base, and the neural bond. So if we look at the reaction coordinate diagram, it looks very similar to the SN1. We even have exactly the same intermediate. The only thing that's different is the transition state and the product. But that first transition state and that intermediate are identical to those for the SN1. And note that the re reaction rate follows the same rate law as the SN1. It's the rate constant times the concentration of the starting material. That's exactly the same rate law we'd see for the SN1 reaction. So the reaction rate doesn't tell us if it's doing elimination or an SN1. Those two are identical. So the only real difference between those two reactions is what does your nucleophile do? Does it act as a base? If this molecule, this electron rich molecule, this, we can call it a nucleophile. And if it's a nucleophile that wants a hydrogen, it's a base. It's kind of like a base is a subclass of nucleophiles. And we, they're the nucleophiles that go after hydrogen atoms. If it does that, we're going to generate the double bond. Whereas if the nucleophile goes after the carbon atom, you do the SN1. So unsurprisingly, you get a mix often, very often of the E1 and the SN1. It's really difficult to control what you get because you have this really high energy species. You have this intermediate that's a carbocation. It's very reactive. And it just does not want to be a carbocation. That's its primary goal in life is to not be a carbocation. And it can do that by either doing an E1 or an SN1. And to be honest, when you're high energy, you're not that picky. You're, you're going to do what you can do. So this means that it's not a particularly useful reaction because you don't have a great degree of control between whether it does an E1 or an SN1. It's something to note is that you're making a double bond during this reaction. So as the hydrogen is being removed by the base, that sp3 orbital that's interacting with the carbon is going to shift to becoming a p orbital to make the new double bond. And so what you want to do is you want it to be aligned with the p orbital. So if your p orbital is like it is here directly in the plane of the screen, you're going to want that sp3 orbital also in the plane of the screen so you maximize the overlap. So as the electrons move into this sp3 orbital to become a c minus, they're not going to have to sit entirely as a c minus. They're going to be able to be donated into this empty p orbital adjacent to it, which will really stabilize them. So they're never really getting a carbanion. You're never getting a C minus. As soon as this bond is breaking, this new bond is forming. And it's because this is lined up. If it wasn't lined up, that wouldn't be the case. So these things need to line up. Now, you normally have free rotation around this bond. It's a single bond until it makes, becomes a double bond. So this normally isn't all that difficult to end up doing. So I'm going to talk about two concepts here. The first one is something called Zaitsev's rule. And this is kind of associated with, you know, stability of carbocations. And what we're talking about is stability of double bonds. So if you remember when we first introduced alkenes, we were talking about the stability of alkenes. And the most stable alkenes were the ones with the most things attached to them, most substituted alkenes. 
And the reason they're the most stable is because of hyperconjugation, because a more stable alkene, an alkene with more things attached to it, a more substituted alkene, sorry, has more sp3 orbitals that can interact with the p orbitals of the double bond. So just a reminder of what I mean by that. The double bond is a, p, is a pair of p orbitals. And if this is a tetra substituted alkene, so it's got four carbons on it, each of those carbons can have, let's say each of them has at least one hydrogen. So they all have these sp3 bonds that can interact with the double bond. And we can move electrons around because things, all those bonds can kind of interact together. And so electrons are able to delocalize. And electrons like traveling, they like being in multiple places. And so you can do that when you have all those sp3 bonds. If they're not sp3, then you can't do that. So hydrogen isn't. So if you replace one of those with a hydrogen, you've just lost one of those interactions and now you're less stable. So the more substitute the double bond is, the more stable. So it's really, really important. So let's take a look at this carbon here. If we're, if I say it is going to do an E1 reaction, so we can rule out the SN1, you have this carbocation. What you have to think about is all the alpha protons that are available. There's alpha one, there's alpha two, and there's alpha three, but alpha three equals alpha two. They're both methyl groups. They're both very boring. Now, if you remove from alpha one, the hydrogen from the alpha one, you have a tri-substituted double bond. Right, there are three carbons attached to the two carbons of the double bond. One, two, three. Whereas if I remove the hydrogen from alpha two or alpha three, I have only a disubstitute double bond. And that's going to be inherently less stable. More stable, therefore a major product. Okay, so why is that? I'm going to come back to uh, to um, Hoffman's rule. So let's think about the reaction coordinate diagram. Starting material up to the carbocation, down to the product. I'm actually just going to color code this to fit with the color coding that we have there. So if blue is more stable as a product than green is, what that tells me is that in general, if green is a higher energy product, the transition state to green is going to be higher in energy than the transition state to blue. Because if the product's higher in energy, the transition state leading to it's higher in energy. If you're starting at the same place. It's not always strictly true, but it's very often true in these kinds of situations here where we're basically choosing a choice here. And so what that means is you're less likely to go down the green pathway because you need more energy to get down the green pathway than down the blue pathway. 
because the blue, you're making something more stable. So as you're going towards the transition state, the transition state to something more stable is generally more stable than the transition state leading to something going to green. Um, we're going to talk about how to get to green. So we need to take stability out of the conversation. And that's what we're going to do with Hoffman's rule. So what this comes down to basically is we're coming. So that was all about stability. Now we're going to come back to our cat with the cat door. So stability is all about how much the cat wants to get through the cat door. The cat can want to go through that cat door as much as it wants, but if the cat is too big, it's never getting through the door, no matter how much it wants to go through the door. And so we can take advantage of that. So big bulky bases are unable to access the protons required for Zaitsev's rule. Therefore, we get the less substitute double bond. So for example, I'm going to talk about things being ball-like or stick-like as nucleophiles. This is a stick-like nucleophile. It looks a bit like a stick. You know, something you can poke your brother with and just barely miss his femoral artery. And so that's going to do the Zaitsev elimination because it can get into small little crevices and it's going to just make the more stable thing it can. I actually, these, these are actually E2 eliminations I've drawn here. I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but it's still relevant even for the E1. Sorry, I'm just gonna make sure chat window. Open. There we go. Um whereas if something's big and bulky, ball like, big cat, small door, it can't get at that proton that we want to get to for the Zeit several because by definition, that hydrogen is going to be on, that proton is going to be on a more substituted carbon. Because again, more substituted carbon, more substituted double bond, that's good. But that's going to be more crowded. And so something really big and bulky can't get at the more crowded thing, so it goes to the more accessible proton. And so we get the other product. And we're going to go over a few examples of these. First thing we're going to do, though, is just compare and contrast with the E2 elimination. So E2, like the SN2, does not have an intermediate. Everything happens at the same time. In a transition state, just like in the SN2, where you had the nucleophile coming in the leaving group leaving at the same time, you're now forming and breaking all the bonds. The base is now starting to interact with the hydrogen. The hydrogen is starting to break its bond with the carbon. The carbon-carbon double bond is starting to form. The carbon leaving group bond is starting to break. And then that collapses down to the double bond. If we think about what the reaction diagram looks like, it's going to look a lot like the SN2. Starting material, transition state, product. with no intermediate. And so what we have in these cases is the E2 and the SN2 are kind of similar. So why does something choose to do an E2 or an SN2? We're going to come back and discuss this in a lot of detail um, later on in this class and next class. But if essentially we're coming back to this cat door thing. In this case, we have a tertiary leaving group. It's on a tertiary carbon. We know that you cannot do an SN2 on a tertiary carbon. We're going to talk about why you're not going to do an E1 or an SN1 on this carbon. And it only really leaves the E2. And so you do an E2. So tertiary leaving group, no SN2.
and essentially it comes down to steric hindrance. So, what helps a knee to go faster? Generally, having a tertiary leading group is better than a secondary, is better than a primary. Why? Because you're going to have a more substitute dull bond if you have a tertiary leaving group. And that's more stable. Zaitsev's rule generally applies. So generally, you're going to make the more stable dull bond. And in terms of stereochemistry, again, we're going to need to make that P or bo pi bond. But now we don't have an empty P orbital to interact with, right? We're going to be, where do our electrons go? Well, we have the electrons in the hydrogen. We haven't quite drawn it here. What I really want to do is I really want to put them into the antibonding orbital of the carbon bromine bond. And if you think about it, we've drawn here the bonding orbitals. Now I can't don't like what they've drawn here, this is from the textbook. What, this is kind of incorrect. You can't donate electrons to a full orbital. That orbital already has two electrons in it. It doesn't want any more electrons. You can donate it to the antibonding orbital, though, which is equal but opposite, right? So you have the little lobe in between the carbon and X. You have the big lobe not between the carbon and X. And so then as the base comes in, the electrons here can donate to the antibonding orbital. And that, of course, is going to break the bond because you've just put electrons into an antibonding orbital. So for this to happen, it must be something we call anti-periplanar. What that means is you have this shape. Like these vectors are aligned and 180 degrees from each other. So they're parallel lines and the hydrogen and the X are pointing in opposite directions, I guess. Well, I guess we could probably do that way. Are pointing in opposite directions from the carbons. And that's what you need to set up this situation we have over here. And the reason we need this, well, why, why are we going through all this trouble? It's because as the base is coming in and it's removing that hydrogen, those two electrons are going onto the carbon. But that will give you a C minus. And C minuses aren't stable. And there's no way you're going to trade like hydroxide, like an O minus for a C minus. That's a bad trade. So that's never, ever, ever going to happen. But you're not really trading for a C minus because as soon as this C minus is starting to form, it never gets around to becoming a C minus because it makes that new double bond. And so what we're effectively trading is the base for a BR minus, which is a good trade. We're, we're losing a leaving group. We're losing a very stable leaving group. But you can only do that if these electrons have somewhere to go. If these electrons don't have somewhere to go, if they don't have this orbital right here, then you're stuck with a C minus. And that's never going to happen. And then no reaction happens. So you need this confirmation. You need to accept, access it. That's some crazy feedback. 
going to, oh, good. Thank you. Sorry. Yeah, self-muting is a wonderful thing. So just like the SN2 has this inversion of configuration, stereochemistry matters in the SN2. In the E2, stereochemistry matters. So if we have two different diastereomers of the molecule, so I'm keeping this carbon is staying the same RRS, whatever it is, we could figure it out, but I just don't care right now. We flipped this one, right? Whereas this one had the bromine in front and the hydrogen in the back. Now we have the hydrogen in front and bromine in the back. So this, it, we are epitopic, to use that term we talked about last term, last class, at that carbons. At this carbon. So that means that we have both an anti, we have both um, configurations of the chiral center, of the stereo center. Man, I'm trapping myself with terminology. Now I'm going to get two different products from this because what I need to do is I need this hydrogen and this bromine to be anti periplanar from each other. And so the way I've drawn it there, that is not a reactive conformation because the hydrogen and bromine are not anti periplanar from each other. So if I start stripping off this hydrogen, there's nowhere for the electrons in that carbon hydrogen bond to go. If you try to donate to a carbon phenyl group antibonding orbital, and that's just not going to accept them because it's like, I'm happy with my carbon phenyl bond. Thank you very much. I'm not going to take your electrons. So I reject that. And what that means is you won't break this bond because the electrons don't have anywhere to go. So they stay attached to the hydrogen. So what we need to do is we need to take this molecule and we need to rotate it. So I'm going to keep the hydrogen in the same conformation. Phenyl group, methyl group. I'm going to put the bromine anti periplanar. Notice that it's 180 degrees. If I do that, the hydrogen is now coming out towards me. And this phenyl group is now going back away. Hopefully, you can follow that rotation. If you can't, please, please, please pick up your model kit and go back to trying with rotations. You thought you were done with this stuff. You're never done with this stuff. It's like those mafia movies you can never get out. Sorry, I just got a little enthusiastic with darkening the line and start looking like a wedge. So now you have these things anti periplanar, and you can imagine as the base comes in, takes away this hydrogen, makes this double bond, breaks this carbon bromine bond. What we're going to result result in, oops, don't do whatever you're doing. No, no. Uh, okay, I'm going to click more slowly. One push, two push. Nope, stop zooming. This phenyl group and this hydrogen are going to be on the same side because you can imagine the molecule just kind of flattens out as you make this dull bond. And so coming up towards you will be the phenyl and the hydrogen. Going back and away from me here will be the methyl group and over here will be the phenyl group. And that's what we see right here. Similarly, for the bottom one, we're going to have to rotate it so that the bromine and the hydrogen are anti periplanar to one another so we can do this E2 elimination. And what we're going to end up with is the opposite E versus Z, Z versus E. Uh, what part did I flip? Um, okay, Nulia, I, I just looked over at the chat. Nulia's count not again. I, I'm sorry, Nulia, yes again. I don't know what you're referring to, but the answer is probably yes. What does the bonding of the alpha carbon look like in a transition state? So um, I think we can talk about that in a second. I'm going to come back to that and try and draw it out better. And what part did you flip at the beginning, left or right? Like between these two, Julia? 
like what part of these is flipped. The left carbon is different. Notice that the bromine is out front, the hydrogen is out front, the bromine's in the back, the hydrogen's in the back, the phenyl group's in the same place. So we flip this, this carbon has been changed. The right hand carbon is identical on both sides. Okay, hope that answered the question. Um, so what does the bonding of the alpha carbon look like in a transition state? I, I really like Bennett's question, and this is where we get into trouble. Um, in the one you drew, this one. Yeah, um, so all I did was I, I rotated, I didn't flip anything. I just rotated the left, I rotated around this bond. I didn't flip anything, I just rotated. So I rotated 120 degrees. I rotated the left-hand carbon 120 degrees while pinning the right-hand carbon in place. And so the bromine rotated down to where the phenyl group was, the phenyl group rotated to where the hydrogen was, and the hydrogen rotated to where the bromine was. Again, strongly recommend if anyone does have a challenge seeing that, please get out your model kit. By this point, we've been talking about this now for about a month and a half. And so I really need you guys to be able to be following along with that relatively easily. Um, well, okay, let me rephrase that. You should be following along with it. It is not easy. It isn't easy, but um, you should be practicing and trying to get through with that. So, um, you know what, I'm going to address Bennett's question because I've got some, I think I've got nice space on this slide. Um, yeah, I do. So Bennett's question, just I'm going to put a little sidebar here, was, it's not, it's not a react coordinate diagram, it's a sidebar. He was saying, what does the bonding look like on the alpha carbon in the transition state? And so let's think about that. So we have a carbon. We have a carbon, sp2 with each other. And forget, I'm, I'm just going to draw wedges here instead of more bulbous things because that's easier. Uh, I don't know. Let's do iodine this time because I'm sick and tired of bromine. It's boring me. So this is what the bonding looks like in the starting material. Now, as we hit the transition state, you can imagine that, okay, let's, let's pick a base. Um, I don't know. Don't, I'm, not, I'm just not getting excited about any base right now. Okay. Let's go with hydroxide. Not because I'm particularly excited by hydroxide, but just, you know, why not? Those are also, this is as all SP3, of course. I'm just not drawing in all the lows because they're just going to make it messy. So that's approaching, and it's approaching this hydrogen, and there's two electrons in this hydrogen bond here, this SP3 bond. Now, in a transition state, what we're going to do is we're going to start breaking that bond, and this, these guys are going to start interacting with the antibonding orbital of this carbon iodine bond. So this alpha proton is kind of in the trend, in the transition state, it's going from sp3 to sp2. So let's draw in the lobes here. I guess we should shade those in. And so it's kind of transitioning between being sp3 bonded here and sp2 being making a pi bond um very careful about how we draw 
Like again, the thing to remember is what we're drawing here are linear combinations of atomic orbitals. We are not drawing the molecular orbitals. And I know you guys have seen a lot of molecular orbitals in the lab. They don't look like this. They, they're like bulbs everywhere. There's like stuff happening everywhere. And good luck figuring that out. Uh, like that's why we have computers. This is something we can figure out. And the linear combinations of atomic orbitals work really well for molecules and intermediates. They start breaking down in transition states. Uh, B minus is the base. X often equals the leaving group. And that's the, that's the nomenclature you're going to see a lot of. Um, as in a transition state, it's really hard to tell because we don't have a way to draw the orbitals as they're transitioning from sp3 to sp2. And then you have a question like, are there intermediate states? Like, is there kind of, you know, an sp2.5 or does it, is it quantized and you go from sp3 to sp2 directly? Um, and the answer to that is yes to both of those. I, I don't know. I don't know how to think about this. Um, the reality is that everything I've told you about hybrid orbitals is a lie. They don't exist, but they're really, really good and useful for what we're trying to do. So intermediates, we talked about, um, talked about this a few times. Intermediates are minima. So if you have a reaction, starting material. So uh, the question I got is, what is the difference between an intermediate and a transition state? R is normally any kind of carbon chain. Any carbon. Normally it's always going to be carbon. So if you have a starting material on a product, you can have like maybe multiple things happening like that. You know, it's got to go through a bunch of different things as it's going up and down the energy diagram. Intermediates are your local minima. And so what you have there is a place where the molecule is kind of stable. And they're almost always no, they are always valid Lewis structures. The, watch me find an example that isn't, but I can't think of any off the top of my head. Whereas transition states are local maxima. A transition state is as you're transitioning from one intermediate to another. I'm sorry I'm messing up these. Oh, well, they're not actually really neat slides. But these are actually, your questions are much more important than what's actually on the slide. And these are local maxima. And so they are not stable. Transition states are inherently unstable. Transition states are the worst place anything can possibly be. Yes, intermediates actually exist and transition states don't. Not, things have to pass through the transition state to get to two inter, from one intermediate to the other. They spend zero time in a transition state because any perturbation of the transition state will knock you back towards either the star material or forward to the product of the individual little reaction step. So transition states do not exist, except they're really, really important. Yeah, you're sort of welcome. Like you're welcome as much as I can I can do that. So I think that that but that's um yeah. That but the, that's a much more important question than the, the the stuff that's on this slide. So the stuff that's on this slide is basically a regurgitation of what we talked about with the eliminate uh, substitutions. Um the E1 rate is dependent on just the concentration of the electrophile. Or if you want to get fancy here, you can call it the acid because it's going to react by giving up an H plus. But let's call it the electrophile. It's the same thing as the SN1. Because the first 
step that happens in E1 is the leaving group leaves. That's what determines the rate. So all that matters is how much of that do you have? What concentration do you have? Whereas the E2 involves both molecules, the base and the electrophile coming together in a transition state. And so E2 depends on the concentration of both. This is exactly the same rate law as we saw for the SN1 and the SN2, except we swapped out nucleophile for base. For the E1, the what the base is does not matter. You have a carbocation, it doesn't want to be a carbocation. The weakest base in the world could come and take off that extra hydrogen and get rid of the carbocation. Uh, Noah asked a really good question. I'm just going to finish my thought here and I'm going to come to your question, Noah, because it's an absolutely incredible question. So your base, for the E2, a strong base is essential. Just like in the SN2, we want a strong nucleophile because it coming in and displacing the other thing is a complete part of that and its reactivity really matters, it matters in E2 as well. You want a strong base. The stronger the base, the better the E2 reaction because the nucleophile is directly, or the base, sorry, is directly involved in the rate determining step. So Noah's question is, during a transition state, does the reaction tend to go forwards more than backwards because of the momentum of the reaction? And is that a thing, like velocity? Um, no, it's not a thing. So there's no preference. In a transition state, by definition, your molecule is, it, you're, you're taking a photograph of time, kind of in time. And so everything is static in a transition state. The transition state has no preference for forward or back. Now, a molecule could have momentum. And so it's like an atom, a molecule could be flying in on something. And so it could pass through the transition state quite quickly and the molecules momentum drives it forward, but that's not really caught in the reaction coordinate diagram. Mostly molecules kind of bump into each other very lazily. Like they're, they're not normally zipping around in any particular orientation. They're just kind of bouncing around off of each other constantly because they kind of bounce off of each other's electron clouds all the time. So reactions don't necessarily go forward or backwards based on momentum of the molecules. They normally go forward or backward based on the relative differences in energies of forward and backward. So you can almost think almost all reactions, we've drawn them kind of like they're linear, like they just go forward. But you know, let's say I need a reaction where my two hands come together and that's the reaction they join together. So in the transition state, they will have gotten close enough that they're almost like my camera's not on. This is not a very effective analogy without a camera. So I'm going to turn my camera on. So let's say I have a reaction where I need my two hands to come together. And when they join together, that's the product. This is kind of a, um, you know, it's almost like the second step of an SN1. You have a carbocation, you have a nucleophile, they snap together, you're done. Okay, but there's a transition state there. There's a carbocation, the nucleophile comes in, and most of the time at the transition state, it's gotten close, but now there's repelling energy between the two. And so although they want to close, it's just as easy for this guy to come in and bounce off and then move away. So it's kind of coming in, coming in, coming in, slowing, 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 because it's getting repelling, 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 and bounces off. Comes in a different angle, bounces off. Comes in a different angle, bounces off. And then closes just because he hits the right angle at that time. All those pass through something very similar in the way of transition state. And they kind of rose towards it, but they didn't quite hit it. And they kind of fell apart before they could get over that top of the energy barrier. And so it's not so much that there's momentum. It's more that sometimes you hit the transition state and fall over. Sometimes you hit the transition state and fall back. But if the product is more stable than the styrene materials, eventually the molecules will collapse towards the product. Because once they make the product, they're less likely to go all, like it's once I've made this, it's much less likely for this to come apart again than it was for this never to form in the first place. But once it's formed, it's kind of stable. So what we're really looking at is the differences in energies, the starting materials and products. And that's what determines which way the reaction goes. And we can modulate that by changing the concentrations of things. And that's Le Chatelier's principle that you guys covered in first year, which is, you know, you add in a ton of stuff and things go down concentration gradients. So if you want to make, if water is a byproduct of your reaction, 
you don't want to do the reaction in water because that raises the concentration of your product and you don't want that. Whereas if water is a byproduct of your reaction, you can remove the water from the reaction as it's formed, you will drive the reaction forward. Okay. So if we're com continuing to compare E1 versus E2, we see something very, very similar as we saw with the SN1. Tertiary is better than secondary is better than primary. And then we have that resonance thing going in, depending on the resonance, whether it's better than tertiary or slightly worse. Exactly the same rules as the S and one. And that's because the intermediate is exactly the same. It is exactly, there's no difference. They are the same thing. It's just what you do with that intermediate once you make it is slightly different in the S and one and E one. And in the SE two, again, unlike the SN two, a tertiary double bond is better, like a tertiary carbon, is more likely to do an E2 than a secondary carbon. And I'm talking about the carbon with the leaving group on it. All this is about what car carbon with leaving group. So they follow the same pattern. And that's because we, in both cases, in the first case is because more stable carbocation, and the second case is because more stable double bond. In the E1, we want a good ionizing solvent. We want a polar product solvent. Why? Same reason we wanted a polar product solvent for the SN1. We want to stabilize the carbocation. In the E2, the solvent is much less important because we're never really going to have a very charged species. Though if I'm going to say anything, again, we want a polar aprotic because we want to make sure that the base is reactive. In terms of orientations and geometries, both the E1 and E2 both prefer to give sites of product when they can. Again, we're going to come back to this Hoffman product thing. I am going to talk about that. And that's a big bulky base cannot give us as I said products. The big bulky base can't get at that proton, which is on the more substituted carbon. Um, so nonpolar is great. If you can do nonpolar, it's awesome. The problem with nonpolar is a lot of things aren't soluble in nonpolar. So sodium hydroxide is not soluble in hexanes. It would be great if it was. That would be a great solvent for it, but you just can't solubilize it. Yeah. And most strong bases are, you need solvent. Uh, you need a polar solvent that can dissolve them. Um, in the E1, again, no special geometry is required because we have that empty P orbital. And so we can eliminate the hydrogen from all sorts of orientations. Whereas in E2, we did need special geometry. So SN2 and E2 need special geometry. SN1 and E1 do not. Okay. This is what we're going to talk about next class. We're going to cut through the Hoffman uh, eliminations. We're going to compare why something will go one way or the other. Because we've talked about these uh, polar product is what we've been using. We haven't been using nonpolar product. And that's because there's no such thing as nonpolar product. Because if something's protic, it's polar. So polar product is great for SN1 and E1. So we're going to be looking at all these things. And what we're really seeing is it's going to be a race. Uh, hopefully I've got, yes. So what we have here with all these reactions is these four reactions are competing against each other in a cage match in any situation. All of them are always possible. The arrows are not complicated for these reactions. These are not complex mechanisms. What's really complex about this is the analysis of which one is more likely to occur under a given set of circumstances. So we have to look at all these things. We have to bring in everything we've discussed all course about charge stability, about size, about sterics, about torsional strain, all that stuff 
is going to come in and decide because we have these four wrestlers in a cage and they're each going to fight. And what we want to be able to do is figure out which one's going to win. And, you know, no one's going to win outright. They're all going to kind of sort of everyone's going to get their punch in and get their little bit of time. But what we want to do is if we can tune and when we're doing chemistry like this, we want to figure out if we can tune the conditions such that hopefully we have a case where we have one of the wrestlers win and the other three really turn out to be paper tigers. And so I'm going to continue on from here in next class and we'll call it a day right now. Yes. So E2 and S and 2 prefer polar A protic. E1 and S and 1 prefer polar protic. And we're going to go through sort of quadrants with these things and trying to do these analyses. So next class is like solving problems with it. Okay. Have a good weekend, everyone.